All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, episode 46 is Q&A. And before I get into the Q&A and the format and the people with which I spoke to or spoke with for this week, uh, I wanted to answer or at least talk about one of the questions that I get often and it seems to be a little bit more prevalent uh, as hunting season approaches. A lot of people will ask me about my bow setup and then specifically about my arrow setup. And if you listen to the podcast, uh, you would know, uh, if you know anything about me, that I'm pretty passionate about uh, bow hunting. However, I'm still really trying to up my knowledge level when it comes to the mechanics of the bow and also the mechanics of the arrows and everything that goes into pairing a bow with an arrow because you can absolutely do that incorrectly. Uh, and one question I get over and over and over again is my own personal setup. And it seems in the archery world, currently at least, there is a debate going on or a discussion going on about something called FOC, which everything I say beyond this point is largely me repeating uh, things that people who know much more than me about archery have said. Uh, but to answer people's questions about my own personal setup or the recommendations that I have, here we go. So the front of center debate literally means if you were to balance an arrow on your finger, right? Well, that would be the center point uh, where you didn't have to hold on to it at all and it could just balance on the pad of, say, your index finger equally on both sides, or not equally on both sides, but it is perfectly balanced on both sides. Obviously, that's the center. Anything forward of that is your front of center. And right now, uh, people are talking about really loading up weight into the front of their arrow. And there are some things that go along with loading up the front of your arrow. And one of the main things is, can your arrow shaft or does the arrow shaft have the stiffness to support that weight up front as it's fired through your bow? Um, and that's called the spine for people who are unfamiliar with archery. The, the spine of your arrow, the measurement of the spine of your arrow determines how rigid or stiff it is. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is hunting season is approaching. And I believe you should train like you fight. And you should go into the field completely prepared. I actually think it's critical to go into the field completely prepared. Uh, for me, and if you have archery questions before I go on and give you guys my advice on what you should do. Uh, if you have archery questions, you guys need to go to Google and you need to look up John Dudley or you need to go on knockonarchery.com or knockontv.com and educate yourself on archery as much as you possibly can. That's what I do. And fortunately, I have access to Dudley. And we were having this conversation one time because he actually, if you listen to his podcast, which is a knock-on podcast, one of the la latest episodes he did was actually on this front of center debate. And I was having a conversation with him about uh, front of center. And what he noticed and what he, a comment he made to me was he noticed that occasionally, if not often, uh, he's seeing a lot of seasoned archers. They're underspined. And what that means by being underspined is they have excessive flex in their shaft as you measure between the base and the tip of your shaft. And by seasoned archer, um, what I'm talking about is people who are more seasoned in years, you know, a little bit older. So if that sounds like you, like you are having a little bit of uh, excessive flex, don't worry about it because I have a solution for you. And it's bluechew.com. That's right, people. They're back. Bluechew.com once some more cleared hot community love. I don't know how many people went to their website and actually went through the process, but apparently enough people did that they wanted some more action here on the podcast. And you know what? I'm going to give it to them because they support the archery community. They don't want anybody going out into the field underspined because let's be honest, it's tough to shoot pool with a rope. So if you are a seasoned archer, or, you know, you got something going on there, what I would recommend that you do, because this episode is, in fact, sponsored by and supported by BlueChew.com, B-L-U-C-H-E-W.com. It is a pill for men 
who as they go through life, maybe they are encountering issues with being underspined. These pills have the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, so they work. And um, I guess thank you to the people who have sent me pictures of open blue chew wrappers and told me how the pill performs as advertised. I don't. Let's just keep it at those pictures as opposed to other pictures. Uh, but thank you for uh, thank you for the feedback and letting me know they do in fact work. Uh, they're chewable, so they're going to work faster than a pill. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. And when it comes to Viagra and Cialis, I've never had a prescription to either of those, but I have heard they're expensive. This is cheaper than both of those. So it's kind of a no-brainer. You also don't have to go to the doctor's office. This is what I thought was a cool thing about it. Uh, just knowing myself personally, I don't think I would have the... Uh, I don't think I'd have the balls to sit in a doctor's office surrounded by uh, other gentlemen potentially having this issue and, I don't know, talk honestly about it. So the ability to uh, skip that and skip the pharmacy line and have something shipped just straight to your door, which shows up in like a, I don't want to say a manila envelope, it's actually a cardboard envelope, but shows up straight to your house into street packaging, it's pretty painless to say the least. The process took about five minutes. If this is something that you guys are dealing with, here's what you got to do. Go to bluechew.com, B-L-U-C-H-E-W.com, and you can get your first shipment for free if you use the promo code HOT, H-O-T. doesn't matter if it's uppercase or lowercase. You'll charge, uh, you'll get charged five bucks for shipping, and you'll be on your way. Remember to hydrate, stretch, and be responsible. Bluechew.com, promo code hot. One thing I'll add is this. It signs you up for a subscription. So if you're not interested in anything beyond this promo, please don't forget to cancel your subscription after you do the initial uh, promo. Otherwise, you're going to get charged. And I think they charge you something around 30 bucks per month, depending on uh, which medication you get prescribed from the doctor. Now that we've thoroughly discussed one solution for going into the field underspined, let's dig into episode 46 which is Q&A questions from the internet. And I was going to, as I have uh, many times before, answer these questions on my own, but fate or life threw me, uh, threw me a pretty good hand. And right now, up here in Montana, I have my father and my brother-in-law staying at the house. Uh, they're on a family vacation. They brought their respective families with them. And I realized that they are a great resource and reference to bounce the questions that were asked to me off of. Um, Again, if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear me talk occasionally when I'm asked about my background and where I have learned or derived or had calibrated uh, my moral compass and where I've learned a lot of the lessons in my life that still ring true to me today. And many of those started on the construction site that I was working with my dad on when I started at the age of, I think he said 12 in the podcast. I'm pretty sure I was 11 when I actually started, though. He's he's getting older, so, you know, maybe the numbers are slipping into his head a little bit. But I digress. Either way, working for my dad in that environment, uh, I learned a lot of lessons that I've carried forward throughout my entire life. And I think there's more power in letting him talk about some of those things and also taking his experience just from growing up in a different generation and applying them to the questions that were asked. Uh, Also, my brother-in-law is a San Diego City firefighter. He has passed his captain's test and is now just waiting to be promoted to that position. So he has a wealth of knowledge in an environment that uses small units, or elements, uh, requires leadership and teamwork. And that sounds a lot to me like my previous career from the SEAL team. So that is also a perfect community and resource and reference to ask these questions to. So instead of just doing them myself, we kind of just had a conversation about each one of the questions we were able to make our way through. So I'd read the question, and we'd go a little bit around Robin and talk about it from those three different lenses, if you will. So instead of me talking about the Q&A, let's get into the Q&A, episode 46. 
Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, win it, man. They give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. I get tired of answering questions just on my own and hearing myself, I guess, think out loud and talk. But a lot of these, as I was flipping through them, um, I'd say I have... And we don't have to get through them all. I'd say I have maybe 15 questions. A lot of them are kind of parenting and leadership based. And I realize, well, okay, I have my particular background. Jason, you have your background from the fire service. Dad, you have your background from the military. Uh, and then owning your own business. And then all three of us are parents. I mean, between us, we have two, four. I was the only one who went a little bit too far. Had three. Never, never go man down. God seven kids between us. So I think that all of these questions can be looked at from a different perspective than just my own. So I'm just going to fire into these things and then maybe we'll just go round robin because I think uh, a lot of these things will say teams, like questions about the teams, but I think that could easily be interchanged with fire service or owning your own bit, whatever it may be. Um, so I think there's a lot to be had. So we're just going to dive into this. First question, when your squad would roll out on operations, what was the single most important skill and or personality trait in your teammates and yourself that allowed you guys to operate with such calmness and confidence in life or death situations? Can this skill or personality trait be developed or were you guys just born with it? Who would like to go first? The mouth breather? I actually don't know how to fix the issue with your microphone, Dad. That's Sounds a, like that's you have a, That's a, an interesting question. <laughs> He's going to ignore that. <laughs> you know, I don't care about the breathing. The listeners might. I'll just mute your audio when you're not talking. Yeah. Roll the microphone closer to your face. You want me to repeat the question? Yeah, please do. And this one, I think, Jason, obviously is applicable because squad could be... What do you guys call your small units? Companies. Companies? All right. When your squad or company would roll out on operations, what was the single most important skill and or personality trait in your teammates and yourself that allowed you guys to operate with such calmness and confidence in life or death situations? Can this skill or personality trait be developed or were you guys just born with it? Well, for me, it was confidence and, and having being raised in a family business and started working really early uh perfection was a big part of being successful and doing it over and over and getting good at it and knowing that you were good at it gave you a sense of uh, pride and it carried over in what you did and always being with people that you could trust and knowing they were doing the same thing that you were with the same precision leads to success whether it's a business whether it's a life or death situation whether it's raising parents and probably the biggest thing of all of it is communication being able to communicate with the people you're with whether it's your wife whether it's a teammate i'm for me it's sports whether it's uh any of those it's communication and repetitiveness and doing it as best you possibly can yeah i looked at it from a little bit different perspective i think um I guess I looked at it from slightly broader, uh, and I just kind of looked at all the different people that I worked with, and I can say that with absolute certainty, we had a uh, vast array and broad set of uh, personal traits that people came to the table with. Some came with a full deck, some came with a few cards short, uh, but everything that we did, I would say, could be taught to answer that part of the question. It can. There's what people bring to the table, and then there's what you can add to that, uh, and for me, the traits or characteristics that I found the most important were the ability to solve problems. And then there's space inside of that. People need to be independent thinkers. And then the root cause of all of that though, if I look back at my career was the control of your emotions, um, loss of control of your emotions. If you look at it from those perspectives, I'm looking for somebody who can solve problems, who's an independent thinker and can control their emotion. If you lose control of the emotions, it starts eroding in the opposite direction. So you can no longer, think clearly so you can no longer solve problems. So for me, for the people that I worked with, it was that 
we called it just being uh, calm under fire. And the way we got about teaching that was realistic and difficult training scenarios that basically highlighted, I guess, an enhanced... People think that uh, training to failure is... If you take people to failure in a training environment, that that's the goal is to get them to fail, which in my opinion, if you take people to failure in a training environment and there's not a lesson attached to it, you're not actually teaching anybody anything. You're just getting people to fail, which is really easy when you're brand new. I can only imagine when you're a brand new firefighter, first day on the job, it would take a seasoned dude of 20 years, about 30 seconds to scramble your eggs and you're, you're done. So all of our training scenarios, if we were to take people to failure, it was not from a broad collection of things that were causing that failure, it would be one thing. We would go and work with somebody on becoming overwhelmed with information. So we would overwhelm them with information to show the negative consequence that can have. Then we would go on to something else and show the the negative consequence of other types of failures. So we would take, and control of emotions is something that you can easily do in a training environment. I have found the easiest way to do it is to apply a stopwatch to uh, apply artificial stress that doesn't exist. But as soon as you get a timer out, people start losing control of their emotions and then you can highlight the impact of that. So those were the ones that I think from, from the career path that I came from was the control of your emotions. Jason. I think um, thinking about incidents that I've been on and going to incidents, I think that rather than a skill, I think that what really separates efficient crews, effective crews from crews that aren't as effective is a, a, a certain amount of trust when when crews can go to these calls and operate in, a, in this environment with a lot of uncertainty, I think having trust in each other is really an important uh, foundation to their success. Um, we primarily work in crews of four people, and just taking one person out and bringing a person in that you don't necessarily haven't worked with them before, and that's all it takes, that one little change, and it can really turn a crew that... Uh, you know, they're having a uh, an assumed skill set can kind of undermine that if people aren't trusting each other. Because there's a lot of, in, in that type of environment, there's a lot of moving pieces and stuff you can't always see exactly. You're not always attached at the hip or you can't see people. And so having that trust, I think, really allows crews to, to operate and kind of take it to the next level. How long would you, that scenario where you're talking about, you take one of four people out, the new person comes in. It's kind of a broad question, but how long in period of time have you found it takes for that person earns the trust of those around them? Gosh, I think that's, there's so many variables to that. I think uh, what, obviously, I mean, we're all human, what that person's reputation was prior. You know, you kind of hear how, you know, what their work ethic has been or what their challenges have been before they even get to you. Even if they're brand new? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because we're at a point now where a lot of people are coming to the fire service that have never done anything. Like we're, we're, there's been such a turnover that we're hiring people that have, the other day we, I worked with a couple uh, new probationary firefighters that had just graduated. It was their first day and neither one of them had ever been to, not even a medical aid, much less a fire. They didn't work for Cal Fire or any wildland firefighting. They never worked on an ambulance. They you know, played sports in school and, and, you know, we're at that point though, and they're going to be good firefighters, but they're raw. Yeah. So that's going to be very different than someone who may be new to our fire service, but maybe they, they spent, you know, five years at Cal Fire, or they've volunteered or did other things. So kind of their past bringing what, you know, what their past is, is, is going to affect that and how much training you're doing in a, you know, some people you can go and do a few drills and you just start clicking right away. And that doesn't mean you stop drilling, but you just start to gain that trust early on and you can get a good feel where other times they're you know, individuals and you're just not quite on the same page and that may take a little longer. Yeah, I think one thing that helped in the teams, and I'm, I'll assume this is the same for the uh, at least the San Diego Fire Service, is you have the academy. So an origin of known quantities you come out of there you should have a certain level of skill and for new guys coming into the teams it's a rough environment for those two guys i mean we've both been there the new guy on the block Mm -hmm. it's an interesting point in your career you can either be polarized and magnetized in the right direction or you can have a really bad experience right off the gate and that can poison you for the rest of your career and i've seen it happen both ways in the teams but i found it took a while 
And it was for the things that along the things that you said too, is people had to demonstrate the proficiency of the things that they had learned as one aspect. And then how well they gelled Mm -hmm. with the rest of the team. And some people, some people you just knew like, Mm -hmm. he's my boy. Like he's a surfer. There's a lot of things in common. And some people I worked with for over half of a decade and it never, and it never Never clicked. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, variable for sure. All right. Buds. And for people listening who don't know what that means is basic underwater demolition seal training was in a way a rite of passage for you. I imagine you had a great sense of accomplishment upon completion. Do you think that men need a rite of passage in life? And what do you think are some examples? So I'll fire away first because this one's directed at buds. But again, I think you could roll fire Academy into this, whatever you, whatever you would want it to be. Um, For me, it definitely was a rite of passage. And I had a sense of accomplishment for sure. But I think what surprised me the most about that sense of accomplishment was how fleeting it was because I rapidly came to the realization that I had just opened the door to a journey. I wasn't even on the path of where the journey was going to take me. Uh, So it was the beginning and not the end of where I wanted to be. I had a lot of stuff left in front of me. Uh, And then the second part of that is I think men and women need a rite of passage. Um, if I could change, if I was king for a day, if I could change, well, this would take longer than a day. If I could make one shift, I think, in thought process in this country, it would be people's willingness and understanding of what happens if you seek discomfort and difficult things versus looking for the easy way out. Instead of scrolling through the app store to find an app that if you look, I was actually looking at my phone the other day. All of the apps that I have are designed around reducing actual physical workload that I have to do as a human being. And they do that and they free up time for me that I waste on Instagram. So (laughs) it's questionable as to whether or not it's a net positive or negative when it comes to time utilization. But I personally think that the human body, and I say this basing it off of how I feel, that if I don't do something physical nearly every single day, I'm not mentally the same. And I see and am surrounded by very often people who will go to great lengths to avoid doing anything physical. And I don't even think they realize the mental uh, consequences of doing so. So I think that rites of passage are I think they're huge. And to give an example, I, I mean, if you would want to go to Bud's, okay, that would be a good rite of passage. The odds aren't necessarily in your favor. Um, and to go back to saying something physical, I would say pick a physical goal. Run a marathon. Do a half marathon. Do a 5K. Do whatever it is, but pick a goal for yourself. And when you achieve that goal, pick another one that you think is more difficult. And I would say the litmus test for as to whether or not it is difficult enough is you're scared you're not going to be able to complete it. And if you're living in that world, I think you're living in the right spot. And I think you're going to grow as a human being in that level of discomfort. And I think that you are going to be a better person at the other end of the journey. Uh, You're going to be able to think better. I think you're going to function better as a human being. Just what you find from, and call it a rite of passage if you want to. I'd rather just call it a difficult physical goal. Dad? Yeah. Probably my rite of passage was, I was, I think, 12, 13 years old. Again, being raised in a family business, uh, and it was a very strenuous business. It was a masonry business, and I was a big lad, and I was enlisted to go into that business and start working as a young man and finding tasks at the beginning of the day that looked impossible my dad would say, you know, I need this 500 brick on top of the roof at this place. And when you start, you figure, there's no way I'm going to complete this by the end of the day. But you learn over time how to think through the process as you're doing it. Do I go to one platform to another platform instead of taking six brick all the way to the top of the roof? Do I take six at a time to one area till I've got them all up there, then to another area? Uh, and working with men who were basically World War II veterans, my goal was just to be accepted into that group and being able to work with them, be able to communicate with them as a young man 
and gain their respect to me was it was it it, it was it was tremendous it was uh it was a very changing point in my life it gave me a lot of confidence they gave me the space to learn how to think and solve problems and that experience has helped me all the way through you know they weren't quick to give me answers they gave me the space to problem solve and if I came up with a solution that wasn't necessarily a fit with the way they've done it but it worked it was they were gracious in allowing me to do that and it was all of those factors of as a young man working with seasoned veterans in a very strenuous physical uh, environment where injury was always there you had to watch what you were doing but being able to learn how to think and solve problems no matter how big or difficult they were was uh, something I've 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 I, I've relied on my whole life it's uh, so you would agree that you think a rite of passage is is important or I would say it's essential but not- I, I, I think it's essential and I, I think it should happen at various times in your life not just at one phase uh, you know, uh, go into the military. I had been yelled at and screamed at my whole life. I remember going to boot camp, and there's 300 men there, uh, young men, and the boot, the drill and sergeants are screaming and yelling, and guys are standing there, pissing themselves in the line, and I'm just going, "Is this it?" I mean, I was used to it. I mean, I I had worse things said to me early in the morning. That they, it was again. That was just another rite of passage. And uh, uh, getting married, uh, coming home and marrying my high school sweetheart, and then being faced with, oh my God, there's bills to be paid. You, you've got to plan your life. That was a whole nother rite of passage. You figure it out. Uh, there's, you know, there. I think there's more than one, but I think they are essential. They are the building blocks of your life. I think what you said, having them <laughs> consistently throughout your life, is important. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I go through them now as as I'm almost 72 years old and I've relied on my body my whole life and now it's starting to, to crumble, but you learn how to adapt, you learn how to use your body differently, you learn to be smarter. Uh, I still walk 18 miles a week, I go to the gym three times a week. Yeah, I don't do nearly as much, but I don't have to because... My goals are different. It's just you, you learn to adapt. You learn to improve. You always got to find that place where you can make it better. And through that, you grow. And you make the others around you better because you get that, that, uh, that sense of accomplishment uh, that is really, really important. What say you, Mr. Donnell? Yeah, you know, I, I think just thinking about the question, I think that there's all kind of different definitions of what people consider a rite of passage and I think in my mind uh, and I certainly would never compare our fire academy to what what you guys go through in in budge training Um, there are some similarities though I think uh, a rite of passage you're going through and it's not it's not intuitive because it's hard and everything in in society now is going to easy less physical work how how do we make things easier but going through a process that is strenuous as a group where you have to work together to get through it, even though at the time is, is really challenging and stressful and tough, when you finish that together as a group and you have those bonds, the, the, the guys from my fire academy are some of the best friends that I have. And we've had children and we've moved to different parts of uh, the city. But when we get together, there's still that closeness that you have. And... I, I think that that is something that is missing from the majority of people in this country. I, you know, I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole of, you know, what's causing all these problems, but there's a lot of high issues of depression and people are medicating. And I think for men and women, but uh, definitely for men, like we, I think we crave that, that working together in small groups and solving problems and getting through that together is is, is, uh, is very re- rewarding. I, I can't, in what you said, like continuing, not necessarily made a, a rite of passage, but continuing in that process, in that group concept through your career. I, I mean, it's one of 
the, the, it makes me feel fortunate in what I get to do because I get to go to work and do that every day versus sitting in a cubicle or just working by yourself or not really having, you know, a, a, a meaning or goals. So, well, I mean, you bring up a good point that person who is sitting in a cubicle and working by themselves, since it was brought up, you know, examples of, or if we could give some examples of other rites of passage, I think you did a good job, job of breaking down that it, it's, it is different. All right. You, like I said in the first question, everybody brings a different deck of cards to the table. And what's, I've seen it firsthand, what seems simple and non complex to somebody is, is, might as well be Mandarin Chinese to somebody else. And, what would you, what would you recommend for the person that sits in a cubicle? Oh, uh, I, I think there's so many options now. Like uh, one of the other experiences that I had that was similar to this that that I kind of realized you just kind of go through life not really realizing how all these experiences add up. But when I was in college, I was fortunate enough to take a 32 day backpacking mountaineering course with the National Outdoor Leadership School, which was up in Bellingham and. That is, that's small group dynamics. You're working with a group of eight people and you're out for 32 days trying to navigate these, you know, the mountains and surviving. And, you know, there, there's there's all different challenges to that. So there, I think that things like that, going out, getting out of your comfort zone and doing something, it's great to go run a marathon. That's hard. Absolutely. Yeah. That, But but doing something as a group is, is the key. I was going to say the same thing. I would say, I, I look back at... Uh, the lessons that that I talk about when people ask me about them, I learned. It's funny. I had the same experience with Pallet of Bricks that you were talking about. Uh, and then in the SEAL teams, I look at the lessons um, from the SEAL teams, from working on the construction site with my dad. You could learn all of those lessons and have an essence of that camaraderie by playing organized sports, by going and finding a group of people. And again, I know we keep coming back to doing something physical, but I think there's something there. Mm -hmm. You can learn about communication and leadership and teamwork and trust and faith in the person next to you and self-sacrifice for the betterment of somebody else. All of that, it's an option, and you can go do it. I don't know if the YMCA is a great place, but it's what came to mind. You can go find a group of people because I agree, a marathon is it's an individual, yeah. it's an individual activity. I'm sure there's support networks and crews yeah. and all that, but you're out there pushing hard by yourself yeah having someone rely on you and you putting yourself in a position where you're relying on them is going to create in my opinion a much greater experience well taking yourself or a group of people out of their comfort zone i've started coaching women's college rugby and i have coached men's uh, rugby for 20 plus years and i literally took all of these women out of their comfort zone and broke them down into small groups with leaders in each group and forced each group to compete against the other, literally taking them out of their comfort zone, not only physically, but mentally. I threw a lot of different situations at them. They kind of backed off at first, but once they started to get a little success, it was amazing to watch them grow not only as an individual but they started to learn to communicate and we had a common goal at every practice i had a common goal what we were going to achieve i sat them down before practice we would talk about what we were going to do and then i made it very difficult for them and they learned how to work through that that sense of you could see them grow just their sense of accomplishment and their confidence in themselves was it was amazing to see. I had stopped seeing that with the men. It became very difficult to coach men. The women that I w have been exposed to, the, watching them grow has been an amazing process. And it's taking them out of their comfort zone, guiding them to a place where they can accomplish something, and then allowing them to do it. To go uh, just to step backwards, why do, why do you feel that you weren't seeing that in the men? Why was it getting difficult to coach the men? Uh, it was, it was just a di different change in the men when I started playing. When I, I started coaching, the attitudes were different. It was more difficult to communicate with them. Uh, the women were sponges, uh, and I'm at a University of California campus, and these ladies are brilliant, and they came to learn. The men, 
they, you know, they all had these attitudes that I. What they, age are the roughly the age of the men uh, you're talking about? Uh, well, anywhere from eighteen to to forty. And this is recent. A this recent is record. recent, and it was such a breath of fresh air to gain a, a group of college athletes who, once they develop confidence in you. They just, I mean, it was amazing to watch them grow. They just, they, they came to learn. And so often the men started bringing attitudes with them. And it, it just, it was very, very difficult. And it, the women were, are, are just uh, different. I'm not saying that's true of all men's teams, but uh, it, it was a problem I ran into and it really soured me on, on at the, the men's level. And that's, Kind of why I went back to coaching and went to the women. It was a, hmm. a breath of fresh air. Question number three. This one straight up applies to all of us. As a man and a father, if you had to pick one core value for your kids to possess and to define themselves with, what would it be? Don't you love it when I shotgun you and I'm looking at Jason just staring yeah. at the wall? <laughs> one. I love the fact that one. I get to shotgun you guys with these questions. I've looked at them for about 24 hours before. Uh, I'll kick it off then to give you guys something to think about uh, because I had the same look on my face yeah. that uh, that you did. To, truly, to try to answer it, I actually couldn't come up with one. I chose two. Um, I, if I had to pick one core value for my kids, it would be integrity. And then a short second behind that would be work ethic. Yeah. I think the combination of those two things, um, I mean, I think it gets you 98% down the road. Yeah, There'll be some variables. But to me, looking at what I value, I looked at what I value the most out of other people. And that's what I would want my kids to be as uh, you know, individuals, men and women that other people want to surround themselves with, the people that I want to be with the most. Are those with the uh, with the most integrity and those with the, exhibit the the greatest amount of work ethic? Yeah, that's that's a tough question. It's, it's hard to limit that. You know, only picking one. Okay, you, um, can, you can have two. Well, I mean, you 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 got to th- you have to have integrity. If you if you're a hard worker and you have no integrity, you're just an asshole. When we have plenty of those, so you you, you want the integrity, but often I would hard- say it's hard to find a hard worker with no integrity as well. Right, right, it, right. They do seem to 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 uh, coexist. I, I, I agree with the hard work. I think I would maybe even expand on it a little bit more. And I would just want them to have drive and, and not drive for a drive slash passion, whatever they have their passion that it's combined with, with a drive to, to, to be the best, find out what that passion is, no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, arts or dancing or, you know, music or sports or whatever, but but find out what it is and then put everything into it to be the best that you can be. I can get behind that. Dad. Yeah, all of those things are great. I think this one's easier for you because your kids are older. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mine is respect. I think if uh, you know, we tried to develop a tremendous amount of respect in our children when they were young, because once they do that, then they develop it in others. And uh, obviously the work ethic, which I see is lacking in so many places today, that, and we try to instill that in our children. I think their success today uh, mirrors what we tried so hard to do. And they got it because they grew up in a family business where you learn to work. And with that work, you, you, get, you gain respect, not only in yourself, that you then get that respect from others. Because if you don't have a work ethic and you're the bottom of the totem pole and everything, you're not going to get respect from anybody. Well, I don't want to interrupt you, but I think that would apply to me because I grew up in that family business, but Casey did not. So where would you? how would you say you taught her those same lessons? Well, I, you know, the thing that we've got to remember is mom had a lot of businesses too. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you were young, she developed a business of putting computer print heads together oh i remember and uh looking for the rubies in the carpet. i mean there was i mean her their mom at 21 years of age became a uh, a division leader of a, a magazine that is now world-renowned psychology today uh she worked for hewlett packard she worked for ibm uh you you watched her in everything that she did she was 
My children are a mirror of their mom. They're highly motivated. They're extremely organized. They're driven. They follow a, a course. They go there. And they, they learn that at home. Mom was just, you know, that type of person. And it was all about respect with mom. You know, and, and, and for me as well, but I mean, you bring it back to the home setting, it's a partnership. And when, when they can see that in both their parents and see that respect that develops them between those two parents, you know, it, it becomes part of their life. Uh, it's, 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 it's essential. And it, to me, so much of it is just respect. And it's, uh, it, it, it's critical. And we look at so much of the problem we go out in society today, and you don't see a lot of respect. The way people treat people at a stop sign or, or some little confrontation or just little things. And it's, we forget sometimes how closely our children are watching all of that. You know, and it's, uh, it's not an easy task being a parent. It's a 24-hour-a-day job. And I mean, I'm so I'm so proud of both both my childrens and their spouses and the families that they're raising. It's just I feel very very lucky because of that, and I think it all comes from respect. I, I like how he gave me a little shout out there. I made it in there. I saw it. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. I had to sneak you in there somewhere. Nice, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you're not taught the value of respect, you wouldn't understand why other people would expect it. You know, it doesn't surprise me if people aren't taught at home. Like, this is the way that you should expect to be treated, and this is the way you should expect to treat other people. It doesn't surprise me that it's a, it's a lacking commodity seen outside of most homes. It's scary what you see out there today. You know, and I taught school for seven years, and it's just the stuff that the children would bring to the classroom. And, and By, the, When you say bring, do you mean physically bring or metaphorically bring? Emotionally, physically and I mean, again, now I'm coaching in a college setting, and uh, just the things as the women get used and g gain trust in you, the issues that they bring to you that myself at that age I never had to deal with. That it's 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 a, it's just a lot of children, a lot of young adults don't come from an environment where that's fostered and they are reaching and they gravitate to it it's amazing how young people gravitate to it when they see it i mean they it because it's you're talking it, about respect yeah respect i mean how you it's like how you treat somebody how you treat your 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 work partner how you treat your spouse any of this it, it, it you can just see the, the relationships grow whether it's your children whether it's your spouses your teammates your your cohorts at work it's I mean, it's, it's the building block of what I think it's all about. Question, what is this, four? Four, yeah. What's the biggest mistake you see new people make, new to a team, a company? I'm sure they meant business, but in this place, in this instance, we're going to fire a company, et cetera. What's the biggest mistake you see new people make, people who are new to a team, new to a company, et cetera? I'll go first. Or you want to go first, Ed? I'm still thinking about it. Right. it? I'll go first because yeah. I, I got to look at this a little bit. Uh, for me, the biggest mistake I have seen new people make is uh, a headlong blind rush at some shiny object, which might be a title. It might be a position on a team. But what they're so they put their head down and they just run, 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 and they go towards it. But what they're missing along the way are their fundamentals. So they're rushing past the fundamentals because they want to arrive at whatever station they feel has, uh, whatever they feel has the most value. Um, the best examples I can give uh, are like sh shooting. Um, if you want to be really good at shooting over the course of a career, you spend almost all of your time working on the fundamentals. If you go to the range your first day and you have a choice between I'm going to go over with an empty pistol and work on weapons manipulation and sight alignment and trigger squeeze and just focus on the fundamentals or also sitting on the range is this badass 300 Win Mag sniper rifle that you don't know how to shoot 
but you want to go get behind that thing and you want to shoot it and you're probably going to be able to hit targets out at 400 500 600 yards and so what you decide to do is just pick up that gun and use that gun and disregard the fundamentals and what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for a long-term failure even though you might have success initially because you don't have the experience and you don't have the fundamentals to get to where you're trying to go uh, another example that I saw often when I was working for CrossFit, people wanted to do, they would look at movements that they would, they called them sexy, the clean and jerk, you know, picking a barbell off the ground, getting it to your shoulder and driving it over your head, or even worse was the snatch, starting in a wide grip on the ground and in one movement, well, one complex movement, getting it over the top of your head. And every one of those movements has three or four pieces that you're supposed to learn in a fundamentals class and then slowly work towards that with weight. But two weeks into the program, people are like, yeah, um, can we just do clean and jerk? <laughs> and what ends up happening is that for a couple days, well, if you have a good coach, the coach says, no, you can't. I'll tell you when you're ready. But if you let them, what ends up happening is they have one or two good days, and then the performance starts nose diving. Or they hit a plateau that they can't get through. They can do a clean and jerk with 95 pounds, but at 105, it starts getting a little bit sloppy. At 115, the wheels are coming off the bus. And at 135 pounds, they barely get over their head and they smash themselves in the back of the neck. So that is, and I saw the same. But it, but it looks so good on Instagram. It looks so it good looks on so Instagram. Good. That's another, that, so again, there's a shiny object, right? People want to open, I still don't understand the purpose of opening an Instagram account other than sharing pictures, but people want to open an account. I want to have millions of followers. It's like maybe just develop a personality first, right? That would be the fundamentals of the Instagram 101. <laughs> um, so that's the biggest mistake I have seen time and time and time again for new people is skipping the fundamentals because they're not sexy and they're not fun. Um, but the biggest mistake I've seen people make, um, maybe not when they're new to a team, but when they've been at a team or a company for a while is complacency. That's the biggest um, actual literal and figurative killer that I've seen is complacency. I've seen it in the jumping world. I've seen it in the military world and I've seen it in the business world. Didn't kill anybody, but hey, it worked yesterday, so we'll just keep doing it for the next week, and the next thing you know, you get flanked by your competitors, and you don't understand what happened. So focus on your fundamentals, fight complacency. Well, I totally agree. I think that the, the people rush first to success without doing the work in between and taking the steps. Well, one of the things I see, I'll go back to coaching, is so many times you see someone who has all the talent in the world, but never becomes part of the team, never becomes part of the group. I'm better than you. They don't say that, but, and they never fit in. You, a lot of times I've developed players who didn't have nearly the individual skills, but what they brought to the team was so much more valuable than what the superstar, quote unquote, superstar brought. That mix, that, 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 potion that they bring it binds everyone together whereas you get a superstar and he's out here shining but that shining just everything else around it wilts and then the team isn't successful i can go back to an example from buds with that from my class i remember vividly because i mean every week is it's more the same than you would like to think monday you do a run tuesday you do a swim wednesday you do the o course and I'm going to say I was solidly in the middle, C, maybe a little bit below, C minus, in comparison to the physical ability of my class. And there were guys who, I mean, they were done running, and I was at the turnaround point on a four-mile run. And then one day that guy was gone. One of the first people to quit was the person who was the best at running. And the, I remember the first guy to quit in my Hell Week class uh, was probably the best swimmer that we had in the class. And every... The per best person at the oak course, gone. Swimmer, gone. And the most, cap I don't want to say capable, but the people you wanted to be around the most uh, were the ones that were just in the middle. They had a 70% solution. They would never stop. They were never going to win, but they also were never going to lose. Um, and they just kept driving. And what I found when I went back as an instructor and saw those superstars quitting, the reason that they struggled so much outside of what they were good at running, for an example. You know, you have a phenomenal runner who couldn't swim for dick, which is bizarre given the nature of SEAL training and the internet. You should be able to put two and two together mm -hmm. and realize there's going to be swimming. 
um, they were so used to being so good at that one thing that they didn't develop a mechanism or a strong enough mechanism to deal with failure outside of that one thing. So what they would do is when they would, when they were physically training to prepare to come to buds, they would do enough swimming to make themselves feel good. And then the runner would go right back into running and they would focus on the thing that they were good on instead of the one thing that was probably going to catch them up. And I mean, you quit in buds. It, it, it is physically painful, but you quit in buds, but because of what the conversation that happens between your ears and they never develop the ability to have a conversation that didn't terminate in failure or a rush back to something that they were good at. And it crumbled. And the, the, <clears throat> those people, especially being a seal, you're a generalist. You're not a specialist. I've yet to run a marathon uh, in body armor, which would suck. And I would volunteer to not go on that operation anyway. <laughs> But it's all, it's very general. It's very inclusive as, as opposed to being a specialist. Well, what's interesting about that is that in a way we're, we're creating a, another generation of people like that through the sports programs that our kids are involved in. I, mean, I, I can't tell you how many parents I know who have kids that play one sport. That's it. So if you're good at swimming, for example, or if you're good at lacrosse or whatever, now that's all you play year round. And you're told you're good. Oh, you're going to play club. You're going to do this. We're going to play on this travel team. Whereas growing up, you had your season. So maybe you were good at basketball. But then after basketball, you went and played baseball. Maybe you had six you, months. You had a yeah, fall sport, a and, spring sport. Right. And, and maybe you weren't good at baseball. Maybe you sat on the bench for baseball. But you learned that, you know, okay, I'm not going to be good at everything. So, you know, kind of what you're saying, these were, were producing people who... You, you don't practice. Most people don't intuitively practice what they're not good at. You want to practice what you're good at to get that yeah. reinforcement. So when you do, like you're saying, you get that failure, it's like, whoa, this is the first time you're experiencing this is in buds? How is that going to play out? Well, there's not a lot of diversity. You, as you said, that we all have is diversity. You don't have to be the, the best at any of it. You plot, you become successful, and that variety of things, whether you're a carpenter and you learn how to frame a house, then you learn how to do the trim work, and then you learn how to do all the the finished carpentry as well. It, it's it's a building block thing, and it's every I just there's not a lot of diversity. I mean, as a, a coach for so many years, I've watched that evolution of it was football, it was basketball or wrestling, and then baseball or track and field, and now. It's, you know, you do one sport and you get a trophy if you show up and you got your shoes tied. It's, uh, there's something missing there. I, I don't know what it is. I think there's value to sitting on the bench. Absolutely. I think there's value to sitting there and feeling that burn and pit in your stomach and being pissed that you're not good enough to go and, you know, like, hey, there's only nine spots on the field to play baseball. Well, I'm the 10th best person, so... I guess I'll play scorekeeper mm -hmm. there. I, I mean, I don't know for myself personally, it was crazy to go back to buds and watch to be able to watch the conversations happen with these students. Cause you can see the squirrel wheels going and you didn't see it as a student when you were there. Cause you're just like, Hey, where'd Bob go? All right, cool. Bob's gone. Like never yeah, see Bob again for the rest of your life. You're so task oriented yourself. You don't have time to yeah, it just, widen the lens and look at them. You know, what was interesting about the first guy who quit in our hell week. Um, when he quit talking about the impact an individual can have on a team, four or five other guys threw the towel in because they thought that guy was so ultra prepared. They looked at him as this guy oh, has obviously got it nailed. And it was like, you know, the bell started ding, ding, ding. And they're like, oh, Jesus, ding, 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 ding. Like, and more guys kept going and going and going. It was really, I don't know, again, the conversation like, oh, wow. You know, these, they didn't have... I have to assume this. I haven't spoken to any of them, but they didn't have the self-confidence to think that they could do it themselves. So when the person that they put on the pedestal fell short of the standard that they had set for them, it also opened the trap door and what they thought was capable. Hmm. And I don't know how to fix that either other than to fail and be comfortable failing and have a very good and crystal clear understanding of who you are and what it is you want to do and don't hinge that on somebody else. Well, one of the you know great examples that I shared with you is when uh, the, the water polo team came and I, you invited me to go down there and 
watch that and watch these I don't know, must have been 20, 25 of just world-class athletes, but they had no concept of how to work together. and how Which is amazing for me. I'm like, oh, my God, this is a layup. You yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. And, and watching them come in and Andy come in and talk to him and tell him his experience, and then literally the last thing he says before he takes him out to the beach, he says, I will hurt you. And they didn't realize, yeah, you're going to get hurt, but if you pull together, and they did not have that frigging concept. It was uh, learning that in teamwork, what it, no matter what it is, whether you're a carpenter tool, a masonry tool team, a firefighter group, uh, whatever. It's that, that bonding that comes, the strength that comes from that. Even if you're the 10th or the 11th person, you're still part of that. And it's that fiber there that keeps you together, pulling that friggin' rope down the road that you can do this. Put, go out there and you pull it. You can't do it by yourself. Put three or four together, and they start moving it. Bring six more out there, and my God, we're moving it. And you can see it. You can see it in them as that success grows. All right, next question. This one's an interesting one. I think you're probably a few years from this, Jason, but uh, I'll be interested to, t to hear your insight on this. As a parent... Uh, who has done the work you have and due to the political realm of the world and detoxification of our world's history. Not exactly sure what that means, but I think I know what they're getting to. How do you as a parent teach your kids from what the history books say to what may have actually happened so that they may know the truth? So your kids, I mean, probably aren't watching the news yet. Right, right. Yeah. No, um, I'm not really clear what they're saying. I, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of guessing they're saying like the watering down. I, I, when I read this question, the essence of it, of what I hear, and again, this is an assumption, is that how do you balance what your kids may learn at school from a teacher who yeah. can lean left or right or somewhere in between? Yeah. What is written in the history books, what they see on social media, what they listen to or watch on YouTube. Um, traditional media and then the things that they hear from their friends yeah because i get this one um and the, the reason i said you might be a few years from this is because like now at the age with you know riley's almost 15 years old and tyler turns 13 next month um they come home with some very interesting and i would say relatively concrete beliefs and sometimes and so to answer the question um, you know, how do I try to separate the wheat from the chaff is what I would mm -hmm. boil this question down to. There's what you see on the news and people talking out of their ass who don't really know anything. And how do you tell your kids or explain to your kids the reality of the world? You First, tell them it's bullshit. That's well, not the way it is. You you be honest with them. Well, that starts with listening to them. So yeah, that's the first, exactly. that's Very the first step yeah. that I actually yeah. wrote down is that I listen to them and I don't try to, although I appreciate the tact, um, and your bedside manner occasionally dead on this topic. <laughs> um, it's also you can hammer people in the wrong direction and they'll shut you down. So uh, it, it's, you know, both of my oldest, Tyler and Riley, go talk to them about Trump and Hillary. They will say some interesting things. And so the first thing I do is I listen to them. And then I just start asking some questions. You know, where did you hear this from? Why do you believe that? Where, you know, did you did you learn this in school? Did you... Read it in a book. Is this something that you saw on YouTube? Is this something that you saw online? And just try to work through and navigate. I, what I don't try to do, very rarely, a couple times, I have said to them, hey, that's total bullshit. Because it was more of a, it was less opinion-based and more into the realm of fact. Like, no, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, so don't believe that. And then I'll take an additional step and say, come with me and I'll show you. That the earth isn't flat. Correct. That okay. would be a, a phenomenal <laughs> example. Um, and then, hey, gravity does exist. If you let go, you don't have to believe in it. If you drop this pencil, it's going to hit the ground. Um, but I try to navigate them back towards the direction of channeling their discovery towards the truth instead of the BS that's out there. The one thing I do try to avoid is to say, hey, no, you need to. Th well, I never say that to them. Hey, you need to think like this mm -hmm. because I don't want to think for them. But it is tough because my kids watch YouTube. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, they don't watch cable news, but you go onto YouTube and you're going to find some stuff that is factually, completely, utterly inaccurate. 
And at 13 and 15, I can understand why that's difficult to work your way through it. They have friends who have very interesting conversations, and they'll come home sometimes with what they think are facts, uh, and they're not facts, and they're opinions. Mm-hmm. And it's it's tough. Just telling them it's bullshit sometimes. No, is, no, yeah. the, the, that was an exaggeration. But the the main thing is is just to continue and keep a conversation going, because through that you can, as you say, you you can navigate through situations and present different information to them talk about your experiences of what you've seen what you've done because the 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 media today is is so opinion based and there's so many different opinions out there that you've got to keep keep the conversation going yeah and and be able to sit at the dinner table and have a conversation or you're taking your son to soccer practice and you have a conversation hey how did things go and it's it's just keeping that conversation and letting them know they've got the ability to make decisions and make opinions but you shape it without crushing them keeping it warm keeping it open you might disagree there's nothing wrong with disagreeing but by keeping the knowing they can always come to you and disagree, which is, there's a lot to be learned from disagreeing because you say, oh, Jesus, maybe that was right. Maybe I hadn't thought about it like that. I still experience that. You know, it's keeping being able, you know, you got one mouth and two ears. And try to listen twice as much as you talk. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, your model of how you would talk, you would handle the situation with, with uh, your kids and if you applied that, we were talking about this earlier today, if you apply that not just to kids but to adults, how how we talk to each other now, this, sitting yeah. down, listening, <laughs> hey, oh, that, okay, so tell me, wh- why do you think that? Where did you find that? Well, what, you've already deviated from the norm of most people when right. you went to step one, which is listening. Right, absolutely. So it, 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 we're, and, and I agree with what you're saying. That's what we should do. And But that's 98% of the adult population doesn't do that. You know, it's like, okay, well, let's, instead of shouting at each other on social media and, or, you know, just yelling at each other, listen. And, and, and I think the, the one thing that I would want to teach them when they get to that point where they're, they're kind of moving into adulthood and having their own ideas is, is that responsibility of researching that stuff. You can have whatever, you can have your opinions and, but Base them off of real facts, and, and there's a responsibility not just for kids, obviously, but for all of us to, if you hear something before you accept that as fact and go after someone else, that you actually take some time and, and, and look into some different sources and, and do some, some research before you're so opinionated. Agree. All right, Jason, this one's coming at you. Because I want to hear about this from the fire service perspective, and then I'll talk the military sp- perspective. Uh, how long have you been a firefighter now? Uh, I've worked for the city of San Diego for 12 years, and I had two years wildland experience with the National Park Service prior. So this is perfect. Uh, and you are, at some point in the near future, going to become a captain. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, he meant yes by that. When you are a captain, uh, and maybe even now, um, you might see this in whatever role that you hold with that much experience. But what strategies do you or your department use to combat complacency? Um, well, we, we do have, from a department standpoint, we do have mandatory training, mm-hmm. which uh, for us is supposed to be two hours a day that we go out and we're doing some type of training. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's hose on the ground. That could yep. mean you're talking, reviewing EMS stuff and... It also doesn't doing. mean that they're not necessarily... I mean, when I see complacency... Um, so I'll give you an example of what complacency looks like in the teams. If you're going to stop somewhere, find some cover or concealment, move in that direction, take a knee behind it. Six months into a deployment, you stop for a second walking and people just stand there. They know what they're supposed to do. Yeah. We drill on going and finding cover and concealment, just like the drills you guys do, right? Yeah. So they could do the drill, but how do you fight somebody who, like, on scene is just like, Phew. not that they're checked out, but they're yeah. just, you know, what I, you know what I mean? That sense of creeping complacency, like, whatever, I've been here, done this a thousand times before. Yeah. I I think, I, and, and that that opens up a whole other arena of, like, well, you've got your, 
your protocols mm-hmm. and then probably the same thing with with the seals there's like the real protocols and then there's kind of like that ah uh, you know yeah that i kind of understand the intent but that's a little <laughs> older and you know so things but, evolve. Could, but that to me isn't i guess that is a, a type of complacency but when i think of complacency to me more it means like you're you're not doing the fundamentals like you're you're uh the things that 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 you need to be doing for your safety and for the crew aren't getting done and i i think that uh how you do that is you you model it you're 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 the tip of the spear you it, it's it by it, you are you talking the, about the, those in a leadership position yeah but yeah but it, that doesn't necessarily have to be the captain that can be the leader can be the engineer the leader can be anyone mm-hmm. on the crew but just the individual i think that seeing other individuals who are not allowing that complacency, who are who are staying focused, taking classes, making sure their training, gears checked out, having a positive attitude, all of those things, not getting caught in the rut, because it, it certainly, I, I can't speak for, for the military, but within the fire service, you you take four individuals, and I mean, we're a family, we're together 24 hours a day, and it, at times, it can get, you know, uh, it can get negative. Um, but, how that's usually broken are people who are staying on top of it and 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 being positive and and just setting the example themselves being the example themselves and then people i think people generally want to follow that um so i i think that that would be the number one way to kind of fight it yeah i found uh i found in the teams be the example that's a pretty good it's somebody should put that on a shirt yeah that'd be a good shirt. I, I gotta give you one of those now yeah. since you said that unsolicited for anybody yeah. listening, um, I found uh, the complacency was easier to creep in for me the longer I had been in. I, I very rarely, if ever, found the new guy as the one who was complacent because they're so fired up and everything is so new. It was uh, I had to watch for it in myself. I think more than than anybody else because as you get up and you just seemed like yeah. I know I'm supposed to do that, but you know what? Nothing's going to happen. I've gotten away with this like mm-hmm. 15 times. I'm going to be totally fine. I don't need to go take a knee behind that rock. And that's the one time that somebody else sets off a car driving by, sets off an ID. And if you're not behind that rock, so you get rocked mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, you wake up in the hospital. But yeah, what did I have down for complacency? Uh, I would say an underpinning motto not published anywhere in the teams uh, would be that there is no there like arrival. You just, you never arrive. So one of the things that we always focused on was the next step or the next logical progression and never, you should never get to a point where you're like, I got this because the second that you feel like you've arrived, you're irrelevant. And the reality is, and I think it's important for people to remember that there's always somebody better and Life should be a learning experience, and so should every career. It should constantly and consistently be a learning experience. And I would always tell younger guys, when you get to a point in this career where you think like you know everything, you need to get out of this career before you get yourself killed. But most likely, that doesn't happen. It always seems to be the awesome person next to that guy that gets killed because of their complacency. So it was a a never-ending pursuit of learning and just trying to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And I, I think that pursuit's infectious. When, when, when it's and, tough to be lazy when everybody, you're like, God yeah, damn it. Right. I totally want to do this, but this all three, three of the four are out there doing it. Like, fine, I'm going to go do better than you. Yeah. Because we, I mean, I don't, I can't speak for anybody else. I have peaks and valleys and sometimes I need that gravitational pull of those other three people Absolutely. doing that. And I'm sure other people need it, you know, cause hopefully <laughs> in the teams and maybe it's like this in the fire service, as we're on our sine wave of life, hopefully we don't hit the trough at the same time. Cause right. that can suck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the business world, for me, I always had to do it right. I had to be the one because I was the example. And like you said, the longer you do it, the more you have a tendency to get complacent. So if show up on time, be there first, be ready to work. And teaching young men how to do that, because my crews would change. Some guys would just say, I don't want to work this hard anymore. So you bring new people on. I always had to show up prepared and ready to go. And decision making. As you get some confidence in them, they get some confidence in themselves. 
challenge them. Say, you know, you're going to set this up. You know I'm going to be here in two hours. What am I going to need? Figure it out. And then be easy enough that you can see it's not exactly right and then be able to be the example to how to make it better. Mm -hmm. Or be humble and open enough to realize that the person with no experience may have, in fact, just found a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. That happened all the time in, I mean, like, we were so, this is the way we do things because this is the way we do things. Look, here's the book that it's in. This is the way we always do things. And then the brand new person does something. You're like, hmm. son of a bitch. Let's change that chapter. But you have to be willing and able and secure enough in yourself to look at that and go, dude, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We need to we need to adapt to that as opposed to like, no, I told you to do it the way I say to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you ruin that person's innovation. Well, I spoke to that earlier about being a young man working and Every once in a while, I'd figure something that would work better and having mature men say, that will work and we'll do it. And that was such a great lesson to me that I was able, I always looked, somebody had a better idea, let's figure it out. That doesn't work? Okay, let's move on. And just taking the time to listen to them and let them show you something, when you got them back to a way, what, the way you wanted it, their attitude had changed and they did it even better. It's just, it, it, it's the learning, it's respect again. It's all about the respect you show. Well, one empowers people and the other one makes them afraid of making mistakes. Yeah. All right. Last question, because we've been at it an hour. Uh, did both of you guys listen to the podcast with Dakota Meyer, the Medal of Honor recipient? Yes. No, I didn't. Okay. He was a Marine Corps I think uh, probably like E4, E5. What war were we talking about? Afghanistan. Afghanistan, right. Uh, received the Medal of Honor. I sat down and did a podcast with him. Uh, and the only reason I ask is because this question specifically kind of asks about him. Uh, it's a long question, so stick with me. But I think we could end on this one. When you spoke with Dakota Meyer, you both commented on how he and other recipients of the Medal of Honor have had difficulty coming to terms with receiving the medal with all of its perceived meaning and being themselves and living their lives. The trouble that they have had in reconciling the difference of people's perception of who they should be because of receiving the medal, their experience of the actions that they took ultimately got the medal awarded to them, and who they were before the medal and who they think they should be now after receiving it. So the struggle between the person you were before you got it, who you were after it, and what society and you think you should be of yourself. Uh, in short, being judged for a moment in time, being expected to live up to it every day by others and by themselves. I'm curious to know your thoughts about the other extreme example of this. What are your thoughts of people who have made grievous mistakes, possibly injuring or harming others? Some of these people may have acted out of character, others because of a learned behavior. Regardless of why, should they be held to that low standard for moments of bad decisions, even though they have or are rectifying their behavior? I'm not asking if they shouldn't have to pay for their actions. If you didn't, if you did it, you owe for it. More that after having paid the moral, ethical, and societal debt, should they still be held as another class of person? I'm also not speaking about people who have made a lifestyle of heinous actions. More about people being judged on moments of times in their life, heroic or horrific. Sorry about the length, but a difficult difficult question to ask oh, uh, that's, in that's, brevity. Yeah, that's tough. It is a tough one. Um, I guess, <laughs> am I who I was yesterday or am I who I am today? Do you, do you treat me how I treated you yesterday or are you going to react to me of how I treat you today? Do we learn from our mistakes? Do we go on? I think if there's a person that constantly doesn't learn from their mistakes... I mean, you don't give them much slack. But if you see somebody who does learn and moves on, I, that's a, I think it's respect again. I mean, that's very simplistic compared to the depth of the question. It is quite, uh, quite a deep question. Yeah, very, very deep. But again, I think it's, am I who I was yesterday or am I ham who I am today? Uh, it's really simplistic, I understand, but it's, I think it's critical. I think we've all been around people who have made horrendous mistakes. 
And I would say, I think it's safe to say we probably all have. I mean, obviously. We all personally have made just, you know. So I'm saying, so when I looked at this question, I viewed it from the perspective of what would people think of me as a human being if all they had access to were my failures? If all that I had to be judged by as a human being were my failures, I think people would have a very different view of who I am in general. Everybody would. Mm -hmm. Um, Because everybody fails. Every single human being is going to fail. And I think it depends... I think you find yourself at a fork in, in the road when you fail. And uh, again, maybe this is broad. I'm certainly not qualified to uh, to make any judgment or assessment of why people do the things that they do. But when you fail, you have, you have that fork. You can either be owned by your failure and develop a lifetime of shit behavior or continue to be defined by it. Or you can own the failure and you can do something with it, which is... I I mean I don't we don't have enough uh, memory on this SIM card for me to go down the litany of failures that I've had in my life, but I look back on those failures in times when things get difficult for me, and it's not I don't ever try to forget them. That's one step. The second one is I try to throw it in the fire when I need it to remember how much it sucked and how disappointed I was with myself to get the fire inside of me as hot as I can to avoid doing that in the future or to drive the action that I'm looking for. Yeah, you you. You you almost have to question the individual who cannot move past another person's failures. Like what 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 do they have in them? Because we all have failure, but what what do what's preventing them from allowing this other person to move ahead? And you know, it, it Jordan Peterson talks about there's. The, the two most popular stories of, of humans is the story of the hero and the story of redemption. Uh, all of, I mean, look at all the movies in Hollywood. Those are the two themes, the hero and the person who's pulling themselves out of the, the depths, whatever their demons were in, in making something better. And that's, that's something everyone, maybe not, maybe everyone doesn't experience the hero, but everyone can certainly experience redemption in pulling yourself out of whatever failure you have. So to deny that and not see that in someone else to me thinks like, well, you know, maybe that person has something. Now, if you were personally harmed by that person and they caused some trauma to you, certainly I can understand maybe you saying like, look at, it's not going to work out for you and I. Yeah. yeah but, <laughs> we're not going yeah, anywhere with this. Yeah. But as a whole, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what forgiveness is such a big yeah. thing in life. Yeah. It really is. I mean, if you see someone continuously failing and it harms you, it, it's it's hard to, to make anything positive out of that. But I had a young man that worked for me for a long time. He ended up going to San Quentin. And he came and saw me afterwards. And we were sitting there talking. And I just told him, I said, you know, it's not what you just did. It's what you do next is really important. And I said, you build on that every day. And he has, and it's it, it's it's a great thing. It's 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 a complicated question. I mean, there's a lot there's of depth so, to it. It's sure. it's like a Rubik's cube. It's so many ways you can turn that and twist it. But I think again, it's your point about why do some people can't get past the bad in those? And I myself, I've lived long enough now. I've seen so many people. I think there's been so much uh, fear and failure in their life that they don't want to see growth and success in other people because it leaves them behind or another thing and i and i think i've seen this in myself sometimes it's you get uh frustrated or angry or afraid of the things that you don't want to see from yourself when you see it in other people so it creates that hiccup well you're, that's you're afraid you if you dislike other people acting weak, it's because you're afraid of doing it yourself. Mm-hmm. There's a connection, like you said, Jason, back towards yourself where it comes full circle. That's a really good good point in this. Is Sometimes we see other people fail, and what we don't tell them is we're seeing ourselves. Yep. And, you know, and then you, what do you do with that? It's 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 really a, a well, very deep, deep yeah, question. Yeah, it, it, uh, just how, if, as you pull the lens back, from the individual and then to the community to society how you you have to have the, there there's a, a component of hope 
that's attached to forgiveness. You, there's always the hope of like, okay, we have these issues right now at a community level, at a society level. But there has to be hope that we're going to move forward. And if you're stuck in this, well, I, I'm going to hold you to this. You're, you're ne- there's no progress. Yeah. Well, you just look at where we are today as a society. It's just, it, it's. I'm just happy. Am I at this end of the rainbow? Because there's things out there today. There's so much despair. There's so much anger. There's so much. So little communication that it's it's really fearful to... Which is odd given we're in a technological state where we have the ability to communicate with more people than ever at all times. And what I see as an old man is I see that we communicate more, but we're actually communicating less. I mean, we, we're not really talking anymore. We're texting. I miss the, the personal t- the f- yeah. feel of hearing somebody. The warmth in their voice, or the the, the 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 cheer of something of something we share, this texting, the all of the internet and what have you. Yeah, it's convenient. I found it fun for a while, but I noticed I was communicating more, but I was actually literally communicating less. You'd be communicating better if you took those sunglasses off. No man, <laughs> it almost be. ties into what we were saying though—the explosion <laughs> of podcasts. Yeah, the the put the. Well, you're using the device, but instead of typing with your thumbs, you're listening and hearing the nuance in the voice. Not that I've ever misread a text and put tone or intent. <laughs> like, you're right, you know, it's, right. it's the yeah. shallowest. All form. caps. Oh, my God. Why are you yelling? I don't know how to turn the all caps off. Yeah. It's the shallowest form of communication ever. Well, it's not. And in, in like we were talking about earlier, with, they were talking about on uh, Rogan's podcast the other day. It's not, if you look through time, I mean, certainly we've been using the press and reading and writing for years centuries but how long have we been communicating you know vocally and listening tens of thousands of years so that ability you know kind of just going to that transition to all reading writing and now it's the the pendulum swinging back and people are getting a lot more information listening for long periods of time it's really a big change well what i'm seeing with young people because I've been thrust in with them again, is that they're so used when they're uh, communicating or they're texting or what have you, if they just want to shut you off, they just do. And I see them do that in their personal communication with people as well. It, it, it's it, it's frightening to see how they they carry those habits from their uh, instant communication to their personal communication. And I and I've questioned some of you know my my young players, and I go, you just blew them off. Why did you do that? You know, and they'll come back a couple of days later and said, what an odd. Oh, obs- there's, a, there's a term for it. Is it uh, what do they call it? Like being an thing. asshole? Oh no, there's a term. It's like uh, like shading or well, basically, oh, God. it means. No, no, we got what you young, call it? Got young kids on my crew. It, it, it basically means there's a term. I want to. It's. I think shade is if like you're talking trash, but there's a term where you're basically cutting someone off. Like you're texting with someone and then you just ignore just them. Chop the and, and they understand. And people understand. Like, oh, you just them. did like yeah. this to me, and it's like, yeah, it's it's just a. You well, stop. I've I've made a rule. I said there is no cell phones. There we 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 don't. We talk to each other. They'll text me, and I said, "You didn't text me back." I said, "You want to talk to me? You call me." Yeah. I said, "I I I want to know what's going on." I don't get that from a text. Yeah, well, it's it's certainly convenient, but I and think it's we been all an interesting that. experience to see how that's added to the, the dance that we have. You know, they listen. For one, they listen better. Mm-hmm. Which is really, you know, as we all know, as we teach and do everything, if you if you don't listen, you don't learn, and you can see them just shut you off sometimes, and that doesn't go too well with me. Shocker! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gentlemen, anything to add? Those are the questions for this yeah. evening. Thank you. Right, I pre- I enjoyed this. It's a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we'll do That's it again great. sometime. That is it for this week, everybody. Appreciate the support. If you like the podcast, do me a favor, tell somebody about it. And if you haven't done a review or written, done a review, wow. If you haven't written a review on iTunes, if you would do me a favor, do that. Um, help me spread the word. That's the biggest thing. If you don't like the podcast or something about the podcast that you think could be done better, 
still do the review on iTunes. I'm not afraid of people saying what they don't like. Um, or you can reach out to me directly if you don't want to do that in a public manner. At clearedhotpodcast.com, there's a button that says contact. Click on that. It comes directly to my email. I'm open to any suggestions or improvements that you, the community of people that are choosing to listen to me every week, may have. So send them my way. And I think that's it. Uh, the Black Ops version of the Be the Example t-shirt is the newest shirt that has come out. I have no plans to have other shirts come out at this point. I'm just going to try to restock some of the other ones. So if you're looking for some cool shirts, check it out, clear.podcast.com. Click on the Shop tab. And I think that might be it. Other than to remind you that, uh, again, this episode is brought to you by BlueChew.com. They are coming back swinging, right? They don't want anybody in the Cleared Hot community getting soft. They're here to make sure you go into this field with the proper spine stiffness. Same active ingredients as Ciala and Viagra. Each first shipment free when you use the promo code HOT, H-O-T, and again, it's at dot com. You're going to pay 5 bucks for shipping. Use that promo code HOT, and five to seven days later, you're going to get a package at your door. Have fun. Be responsible. Don't get crazy. Hydrate and stretch. That's it. See you guys next week.